Good evening and welcome to Strand Millis Evangelical Presbyterian Church. Uh, this is our midweek Bible study and prayer meeting. It's great to have you with us. It's good to join together and come to God's Word and come to speak to Him in a time of corporate prayer. Well, we're going to turn in a moment to God's Word and to James and chapter 4, the epistle of James and chapter 4. We're coming to think about using our words this evening, watching our words, how we speak to one another. And just as we come and turn to that passage, let's ask God for his help. Let's pray. Our gracious God and our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come into your presence. We thank you that once again we come to you with hearts that are full of thanks. You are our Father. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. What love you have given to us to bring us sinners into your family, to call us your children, that we have your name put upon us, that we would be under your fatherly care, protected, provided for, that our elder brother is the Lord Jesus Christ, that we have brothers and sisters in this family of God. You have richly blessed us our father and we come tonight to worship you to treasure you to stop and come away from this world for a moment and just to consider who you are our maker our defender our redeemer and our father and we thank you that this is all true in the gospel this is all true because of jesus our savior and as we come to his word tonight please help us and bless us and help us as we pray together later on may we be blessed as we draw near to you in your word in jesus precious name amen well let's turn together then to james 4 we're just going to look at verse 11 but we're going to read from verse 1 down to verse 12 james 4 and verses 1 to 12 let us hear the word of god what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says, He yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law, and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbour? Amen. And we thank God for his word. Watching our words. Watching our words. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. That's what James tells us here in chapter 4 and verse 11. I wonder, do you know how many words on average that you speak every day? I wonder if you've got any idea. I'm going to give you a moment, not to Google it, but perhaps if you're with someone else to have a quick discussion about it. How many words do you think you speak on average a day? Now, there's probably some of you who did Google it. 
Uh, and if you did, you'll see that the answer there given is 7,000. Uh, but there's lots of different studies, and, and one I found said that people speak up to 20, 25, 30,000 words a day, and that the average in this particular study was 16,000 words every day. 16,000 words a day. Let's assume that we are in bed for around eight hours. And so that means that we're speaking 1,000 words for every hour we're awake. 16 words every minute. Those are incredible numbers, aren't they? And our words matter. Words can build people up and encourage, but words can very, very easily tear down and cause dispute. Words do lasting damage. How often do we feel that we wish we could take back something we've said? The moment it's left our lips, we've gone too far, we've said something we regret. Is it any wonder that David in Psalm 141 and verse 3 says, Set a guard over my mouth, O God. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Well, this is our, our one another this evening. We are not, James tells us, to speak evil against one another. And as we come to think about this, about watching our words, we want to ask ourselves three questions. Firstly, what does James mean? What, what is he talking about when he, he describes speaking evil? Secondly, why? Why do we typically speak evil? Why does James need to warn us in this particular way? It's the first of the one another's that is a do not do not do something. And why is it that James needs to word it in that particular way? And then thirdly, how? How can we change? How can we receive the help of God? So those are our questions. What, why, and how? And let's come to think about this passage together. What, first of all? What? What does James mean? What is he talking about when he describes speaking evil against one another? Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks evil against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. And I've read on just a little bit there so we can get a fuller flavour of what James is talking about. But when James talks about speaking evil, he is describing the making of unnecessary judgments about other people. Now we need to qualify that immediately. He's not talking about some judgments which are necessary in the church. He's not saying it's always wrong to make judgments. There are judgments that need to be made. Church leaders sometimes unfortunately have to make judgments about sin. Church members have to be judgmental in the sense of discerning about what they're hearing, about the teaching that they are receiving, testing it against God's word. What James is talking about are not those necessary judgments, but unnecessary judgments that are often seen in what we might call a judgmental spirit. Having a judgmental heart. That's why he ends verse 12 by saying, who are you to judge your neighbour? Judgmental spirits manifest themselves in many different ways. They can be passing on gossip that we kind of hope is true about someone else. They can be inferring motives or intentions when we just don't know what someone meant in what they said. It could be talking about a sin that did happen, but we don't need to talk about it with other people. We don't need to dissect it and discuss it. It can be highlighting someone else's weaknesses. We're passing a judgment on someone's life situation and we don't know the full facts of that situation. It could be speaking behind others' backs, slandering someone else. But perhaps you're thinking, well, hold on a minute, we're not together at the minute. We're not seeing one another regularly. How do those things really happen? This isn't all that relevant to us right now, is it? But think of for a minute about who James is writing to. He's writing to, he's told us, the 12 tribes in the dispersion. Uh, these are Christians who've been scattered abroad. People who've had to leave their homes and their church communities. Perhaps now they've joined other church communities. Uh, and as they do that, some Christians are, are passing judgment on, on other Christians. Uh, James has talked about that at the start of chapter 2. 
Here he said, My brother, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in. Well, don't pay attention to the one and not the other, James says. They're passing judgment on one another, just purely on their appearance. And this was happening in in many different ways in these churches which had been scattered abroad. In slightly different contexts to us, they could still meet together, but they're meeting together with less familiar Christians. They've had to maintain contact with their uh, Christian brothers and sisters in, in their normal congregations with a little more effort now. And perhaps as we receive text messages and WhatsApps from one another, It can be easy to, or possible at least, to misinterpret when there's no tone, when there's no face-to-face communication going on. We can misinterpret what other people are saying to us. Perhaps you at the minute are spending more time on social media than you normally would because you're at home and you don't have so much to do. And in that context, perhaps feelings of jealousy or competitiveness can start to creep into your heart and you can find yourself getting very past remarkable about other people's lives, about what they're doing. Before you know it, a judgmental spirit is creeping up and you're speaking evil about one another. This is what James means. He's talking about a judgmental spirit that manifests itself in many different ways. But at the heart of it is making unnecessary judgments about other people. But secondly, why then? That's the what question. The why question. Why? Why do we speak evil? Why does James need to to phrase this in the negative? Why are we not to speak evil against one another? Why is it that far too many of those thousand words every hour that come out of my mouth are unkind or misrepresenting or passing judgment that doesn't need to be in some way? Why are we like this? Well, to understand that, we need to understand James' theology. And one of his key principles throughout this letter is that faith is shown in action. And in particular, when it comes to our words, that what comes out of our mouths simply reflects what is in our hearts. What comes out of our mouths simply reflects what is in our hearts. And that's what his half-brother, the Lord Jesus, had taught the crowds, and particularly the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 15. There Jesus has told them that what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and it's this, rather than unclean hands, that defile a person. And James has termed it slightly differently in chapter 4 and verse 1. When he has asked these Christians, what is it that causes quarrels and fights among you? Why is it that the church is a bit of a war zone at the minute? Well, his answer is, is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? And this is the reality of our hearts as Christians, brothers and sisters. There is a war going on. There is a war going on in our hearts. In particular, there are three battles in our hearts that mean that evil speech comes out of us all too easily. The first concerns our view of others. Three times in uh, verse 11, James says the word brothers. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law. Uh, And as Christians, that's what we are. We're brothers and sisters. We have a father, a heavenly father. We have been adopted into his family. We are part of his household. We are children of the one father. And that's what we have forgotten when we speak evil against each other, when we misinterpret the tone of that text, when we pass on that piece of juicy gossip, And as children in a family can sometimes sort of jostle for position and attention from their father uh, and stop in that sense being siblings and start to be rivals. So sometimes in the church we can be jostling for position and we can forget that we are siblings and treat each other as rivals. 
But there's a second battle going on in our hearts, and it's not just simply our view of others, it's our view of God's law. Our view of God's law. Do you see that in the second half of verse 11? The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge, James says. Why is this so? How do we become judges of the law when we have judgmental spirits? Well, James has told us in chapter 1, uh, that God's law, God's word, is like a mirror. It's a mirror that we look into and it shows us our faults. It shows us where we have fallen short. Uh, like when you look in the mirror every morning and it shows you that your hair's out of place or that your clothes aren't quite sitting right or that something needs attention. God's word in our spiritual life shows us where we are falling short. The parts of our lives that need attention. Now what do you do with a mirror? When you look at it, don't you? You hold it up. If it's a handheld mirror, you hold it up to yourself. You don't turn it round and hold it up to other people. You don't use it to look at others through. You don't walk around and shove it in their face and say, have a look at that. You look at yourself. But you see, some of these Christians in these churches, rather than using God's word as a mirror, had turned it round. And they were holding it up and using it as a weapon. That's why James says, if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. You're less focused on carrying out what God's law demands of you. And you have become a, a judge. You're walking around with God's law, holding it up to everyone else. But you need to turn that mirror around, James says. You need to look at it yourself. That's what Jesus said, isn't it, in Matthew 7, and verses 3 to 5, you remember, in the Sermon on the Mount, when he's speaking there about judging one another. And he uses that very graphic imagery of a speck of dust in our brother's eye, brother's eye, notice the language, and a log in our own eye. And he says, first, remove the log in your own eye. Look at yourself first. Hold the mirror of God's law around to yourself first before you turn it round to others. That's what my parents always taught me as a child. They always used to say, don't point your finger at anyone else. Because when you point your finger at someone else, there's three fingers and a thumb pointing back at you. And actually, God's law is a law that for us is to be done. God's law places positive obligations on us towards others. It's the law of love. Isn't that how Jesus summarized it in Matthew 22? We're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind and strength. And we're to love our neighbour as ourselves. Who are you to judge your neighbour? James said. But the reason why we speak evil against one another, it's not simply that we've got a wrong view of others or that our view of God's law is wrong, but thirdly, that our view of God himself is wrong. See, James says, well, when we turn the mirror around at other Christians, what we're actually doing is seeking to take the place of God himself. He's the giver of this royal mirror. And he's the one who holds it. He's the one who holds it up to others. Because he is the only perfect one. Who is absolute perfection. Who doesn't need a mirror because every part of his character is perfect and pure and holy and true. He's God the Father, the, the giver of this royal law. He's God the Son, the one who came to earth and kept this royal law. Who James grew up with in that carpenter's home in Nazareth. And he's God the Spirit, the one who comes now to apply God's law. To show us where we have fallen short of its standard. And you see, ultimately, when I display a judgmental attitude to other believers, when I make unnecessary judgments about them, I am putting myself in God's place. Verse 12, there is only one lawgiver and judge. He who is able to save and to destroy. It's only God, James said. And he will judge one day. Who are you to judge your neighbour? 
who do you think you are, James, effectively said. So what does James mean about speaking evil? Well, he means that we're not to have a judgmental spirit, to make unnecessary judgments of other Christians. Why is it that we speak evil? Why does James need to phrase this question in this way? Well, because what comes out of our mouths reflects what's in our heart. And what is in our heart is a wrong view of others, a wrong view of God's law, and a wrong view of God himself. How then? How can we change? How can we change? What do we need to do? Do we simply just need to speak less? If we cut down those 16,000 words down to something more manageable, like three or 4,000, will it help? Well, yes, perhaps a little. It certainly might be a start. What do we need to do? Try harder to be nice. Be better people to one another. No. You see... What comes out of our mouths reflects what's in our hearts. The issue isn't really a mouth problem. The issue is a problem with our hearts. Our hearts need attention. And actually that's what James has been addressing in the end of chapter 3 from verse 13 down to uh, verse 12 here of chapter 4. In those verses he's been talking about two different types of wisdom. Uh, One is uh, the wisdom from below, as he puts it, a worldly way of thinking, a me-first kind of attitude, dismissing other people and having self at centre of the world. The second type of wisdom is what he calls the wisdom from above, a heavenly wisdom, a wisdom that comes from God and therefore seeks to please God, that lives life with him at its centre. And yet the reality is, as James has told us, our hearts are a battleground, a war zone. We have been given heavenly wisdom and yet within our hearts there is so much me. Worldliness. Worldly ways of thinking. Both are there. There's tension. God is in control of our lives. But the old man in us wants to take back control. And so for our words to change, our hearts must constantly be changing. Firstly, that means that we must repent. James has spoken about that in the verses that we read. He's just called these Christians adulterous people. And he says that they need to, verse eight, uh, verse nine, sorry, be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Isn't it true that very often when it comes to sins of our speech, we rationalise them or we excuse them away as character flaws, as just who I am, that's just what I'm like, or we shift the blame onto whoever we're judging. No, 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 says James. You need to weep and mourn. You need to realise that this is wretched in the eyes of God. You need to repent for these sins which you perhaps think are little and trivial and small, but in God's sight are serious. But secondly, we need to receive. We need to receive God's grace. He has called these Christians adulterers and adulteresses. But what does he go on to say, verse 6? But he, that is God, gives more grace. And the God whose word points its finger at the areas of our lives that fall far short of his standard is the God who stands ready to forgive, the God who stands ready to restore, and the God who is in the process of renewing us in the image of Christ. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you, James promises us. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Come to God. Receive his grace. Be changed by him. Come with your broken heart to God. Come with your heart that loves him and yet so often loves itself. Bring it to him. Ask him to change it. Like David, say, set a guard. O God, over my lips, keep a watch over the door of my mouth. Bring all your evil speech to God. He will forgive you. 
he will use your tongue to instead of judge others, praise, honour and glorify him. May God help us to watch our words and to use them for his glory. Well, we're going to move now into a time of corporate prayer and we look forward to praying with each other. Don't forget that if you haven't yet signed up to your prayer group but you'd like to be a part of one, please just text one of the elders now and you'll be able to join in with their Zoom prayer group. Thank you very much.